um, this is the equinox. So every year twice, the equinox, the sun, during the sunset time, the sun will go down like right in the center axis of this whole institute. And these are the two main buildings, the south and north building. So it's pretty marvelous. And this is a picture from last year. So anyway, um, yeah, so thank you for having me. And my name is Lin Jing Feng, and you can call me Lin. I'm from the Salk. Uh, for, some, from, for some of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's located in La Jolla. It's in the San Diego area. And today I'm going to share um, some recent work that has been done in our lab, uh, which is deep learning based super resolution on images acquired on point scanning imaging systems. So basically we're talking about um, confocal light microscopy or scanning electron microscopy here. So the whole, the, the whole story comes down to, we call it the eternal triangle of compromise of all the microscopists. Or if you're a photo photographer or if you love photography, you probably also have a deeper understanding of this. So it's almost impossible to optimize or to maximize your imaging speed, your image resolution, and the sensitivity at the same time. If you want to max, maximize one of those three, you almost always need to sacrifice the other two. And this is also true for scanning electron, sorry, scanning point scanning imaging systems. And the way how it works is instead of um, shining the, illuminating the, illuminating the light across your whole sample, you have these uh, electron beams for scanning electron microscopes, or you have the laser beam for the, uh, fluorescence laser scanning microscopes. And you have the beams illuminating one point of the sample and the user can arbitrarily de define the sampling rate of your region of interest in both X and Y. So after you define the pixel resolution in X and Y, the, you have the laser beam or the electron beam shining across, scanning across the sample horizontally to form the whole image. So that also means if you want to achieve higher resolution using a point scanning systems, then it requires you for higher sampling, which means you need to specify smaller pixels, which also means it takes much longer. It means it's higher resolution, higher SNR, but then at the same time, your sample is also receiving higher energy and for some cases, for example, like live cell imaging using light microscope, microscopes, then it means higher sample damage. So one example I'm showing here, this is a, a live recording of what you can see actually under a scanning electron microscope under the low res, which is eight nanometer, uh, eight nanometer pixel size version and under high res, acquisition mode, which is two nanometer pixel size. As you can see that the one to the right, which is a high res version, hopefully you can see the refreshing of the videos. So the one to the right is higher resolution, it's nicer, but the refreshing, which means the imaging speed is a lot lower than the left one. And here's another example. So oftentimes for EM, we will want to do volumetric imaging, which is 3D imaging. And in this case, in our lab, we often use something called serial block um, three view imaging, which works kind of like this noodles machine to the left. So you fix your sample in a plastic block. You cut one slice, put it under the microscope, image it and cut another slice and then image it. And until you, you reach to the section of the, whole, of the bottom of the block. So, here I'm showing you the middle one again is a high res acquisition. The one to the right is a low res. The high res gives you really high, a nice resolution. But the problem is like recall our triangle compromise. Because of this excess energy, the sample that takes, you're, you don't get that smooth, nice cut anymore. Instead, you're more like cutting a smelling, uh, sorry, melting, melting butter. So that's why that's reflected on this video is 
um, the samples start to peel off, start to break down. And whereas in the low res version, you get nice smooth recording, uh, not recording, nice smooth um, 3D stack of the low res. But again, it's lower, res it's lower resolution, it's lower signal to noise ratio. So as we know, deep learning has already been successfully applied to realistic photos to increase the resolution of a natural picture or of a, someone's human face to a higher resolution version. So we were thinking three years ago, can we also use deep learning to um, similar idea in our case in microscopy images from a point scanning system to do the same thing to supervise the low res version of the undersampled image. Well, this is our approach. So we terminate point scanning imaging system. I'm going to refer to it as PSSR. Um, so the way how we, how we uh, use the training data is we create a method called crapification. Well, how, what does that mean? So um, for EM training, we have these, we got these very high quality gold standard high res images. That's two nanometer resolution. That's, uh, that's imaged under the microscope. Um, and then we crapify the high res version to get its lower res version. By crapifying, I'm saying down sampling at the same time, enjoy uh, injecting noises. So after you get these very perfectly aligned semi-synthetically generated training image pairs, you will be able to train our model, our PSSR model. In this case, we used a REST block-based REST unit. And after, after the training stage, you have a trained PSSR model. And then we start to test on both semi-synthetically generated low res and high res version. But more importantly, we also go actually under the microscope, take the low res real world version and feed it into the trained PSSR model. And the model gives us the low, low res, um, PSSR restored low res version. We call it LR PSSR. You compare that with your high res and see how good it performs. And you may ask me, why do we need to do the craftification? Why can't we just go under the microscope and take the image pairs? So one thing is, um, probably most of you are aware that taking high, extremely high resolution plus the low resolution version is really time consuming. If, and another problem is it's also very difficult for you to perfectly align these images of exactly the same region of interest, but in different resolution mode. And as we can see in this table in the first row, if it's real world data pairs, let's say for this, uh, for this particular example, we use 80 gig of EM data. That takes more than 480 imaging hours. And it's hard to align and the cost is almost 70,000. But what if for scientists who already have their high res data collected for some other scientific purpose and it's already sitting there with our approach and um, what it only takes is letting the computer do the job, the craftification. And again, using the same example, it only takes two hours of computational power and it only costs $16. And under the scenario, if you don't have the existing high res version, then what you need to do is taking the high res version and there's no alignment required. And here I'm showing some results. It works. PSSR restores the, uh, again, semi-synthetically generated testing pairs and real world testing pairs. So here on the top row, I'm showing the semi-synthetic testing results, the visualized four versions from the left to the right is the LR, which is generated or crafted from the high res HR version. LR, uh, LR bilinear is the bilinearly upsampled version. The LRPSSR is our result. 
And beyond the visualized image, we also quantify using two classically used uh, metric um, to measure the image quality, which are peak signal to noise ratio, PSNR, and SSIM, which stands for structural similarity. And as you can see that PSSR is always much better than bilinear. And that's for the semi-synthetic. Now we look at the bottom row, which is a real world pairs. Again, from left, right, LR, bilinearly upsampled, PSSR and HR. So it was really fascinating for us to um, back then to first see this data because if you look at the LR version, the vesicles, well, by the way, you're looking at a uh, presynaptic button in a brain section tissue. So these little vesicles are from the presynaptic button. In the low res version, you almost don't see them. And it's so noisy that you don't have the confidence to call, to count or to segment. And well, same thing goes in the bilinear, but the PSs are really nicely restored, these structures. It's beyond just deconvolution, beyond just denoising. It actually does something more magical. And if you like, look at the quantification for the real world testing result, which is more important, um, again, PSNR and SIM is much better. And we also quantify it using um, also like a standard method in EM to quantify the resolution of an image, which is called FRC, which stands for Fourier Rain Correlation Method. And you can see that PSSR's resolution is on the same level of the HR. And it's better than, of course, it's low res version input and the bilinearly upsampled version. And here I'm showing you a well restored three view 3D stack restored by PSSR. Before, recall the Noodles machine slide that we couldn't get a nice 3D high-res um, high res volumetric data. But now with the assistance of PSSR, we are able to take the low-res eight nanometer pixel size um, 3D stack as your input and you get a smooth um, 3D stack. And something else that also amazed us is, you know, in most cases, deep learning work, in most cases of deep learning work, uh, the testing data needs to be really, really close to your training data. But in this case, specifically, um, well, I would say it's, it's more especially true on the EM data, that PSSR also works on data from a different lab that's imaged under different imaging setting, under different microscope. I remember we did a workshop, I think maybe one year ago uh, in Austin. And then the night before the workshop, we, we asked people to send us their, uh, their data. Well, we don't know them. And then the night before they, they sign up on this sheet and then we got these images from different labs. The next day we, we, tested, we tested live. And here shows one example of the, um, of the testing result. So this data has never been seen by the network, but again, it's restored very well, I would say. The noise is the, uh, is the noise is much higher resolution. And here's a static version of the res restoration of the vesicles and the boundaries. And here are more examples of the testing results on say different different tissue, different, uh, slightly different electron microscopy modality, and they're all well restored. So it tells us there is some flexibility or generalized, general, what's the word? Like generalizable of property of, P, of PSSR. And also PSSR enables much better semi-automated segmentation here you're looking at um, reconstruction of using a, a stack that's restored by PSSR and different tissue are labeled in different color. And this is done by Sammy Weisendolvac from our um, imaging institute, uh, sorry, imaging core. And, and according to him that the 
the version of the PSSR restore version is much easier, is, is smoother. It's just easier to segment than ever before. And beyond all the visualized, the reconstruction, the metric, another thing that a lot of microscopists care is how well, how can I actually use it for my downstream practical usage? So here we further quantify that um, PSSR can actually be effectively in use for downstream vesicle segmentation task. So in this case, in this experiment, we have two human specialist evaluators that we give them blindly encoded um, image of these presynaptic boutons of the bilinear version, the PSSR version, and the HR version. They're all mixed up. They don't know which image is from which stack. And they were asked to segment these vesicles. And, as, and the result that we found was the error using the PSSR restore stack from the, from the two humans is actually within the same range of the error between the two human evaluators. And of course, it's much better than the bilinear version. And that tells us we can already use PSSR for, with confidence for downstream segmentation task in this case. Well, that's enough for the EM part. And the same story, a same principle also applies to um, light point scanning imaging systems. In this case, again, I'm showing you two versions, low res on the top and high res on the bottom. The top one refreshes much faster, but it's noisier. The bottom one is taken, well, the first one is, ta uh, is taken by a uh, standard confocal, and the, the bottom one is taken by air scan, which is a fancy version of confocal. It's higher resolution, but the refreshing rate is much lower. And here's another example. As we again recall back to our triangle compromise, this is a high res um, time lapse video, and you're looking at a mitochondria network is high resolution, but at the same time, you start to see this mitochondria getting fatter, getting bigger, and getting stressed. They're angry. This is because of the excess energy that we use for the high resolution imaging. And this is not something that, that we, want to, we want to have when we do live cell imaging because we don't want to disturb the normal behavior of those cells. But in this case, we do. And here's another example. To the left is the high res, to the right is the low res. And you're looking at mitochondria trafficking along an axon. So these little dots that's moving around, some of them are like kind of um, staying in the same place, but some of them moves really fast. And these are mitochondria trafficking. So to the left, you can see it's higher resolution and to the, the right one is lower resolution. But at the same time, you may also observe in the high res version, which is the left version, you can see this mitochondria kind of like, they're not smoothly mo moving. They're kind of hopping around between frames. That tells us the temporal resolution of this, this video is not high enough because our, our refreshing rate is not high enough to capture this fast movement. Whereas in this low res version, mitochondria, even though they're fatter, they're lower resolution, but they move smoothly. And this is also reflected in, and in the bottom left, the, it's called chymograph. Um, if you don't know what a chymograph is, it's pretty easy. It basically, you draw a line along this axon and you plot the intensity value along this line over time. So the x-axis is the intensity plot of this line, and the y-axis is a plot of the intensity value uh, across time. So the y-axis is time. So it's a nice way to visualize both the temporal and spatial information on the same graph. And as you can see that the left one 
the mitochondria, the, the fast moving mitochondria, mitochondria are really dotted, but the, but not moving one, they stay in the same place. That's why they look kind of like a line. They are much thinner than the version to the right, which means it's higher spatial res resolution. But if you look at the right one, these fast moving mitochondria, they're so nicely connected. So um, on top of the crapification approach that I introduced earlier, especially for this live cell time-lapse imaging, we also introduced something called multi-frame approach for the training. So in this case, instead of taking one image, the low res, the crapified low res and the high res as our training pairs, we crapified five consecutive frames all together as our low res. And we take the middle frame, high res version as our target. So this, so this five low res and the one single middle frame high res, it will be our training pair for live cell imaging data. And we use the similar res block unit architecture. And here again, I'm showing the same in the same fashion of this results, testing results on both semi-synthetically generated testing data and the real world data. So here you're looking at again, mitochondria um, from left to right, low res. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but uh, laser pointer. Yeah, so we have the low res, bilinear, single oh, we frame. Can see it, that's fine. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so single frame, multi-frame, single frame, which is basically the same as the EM version. And we have the multi-frame and the ground truth high, um, HR air scan, which is our high res version. And I want to draw your, your attention to these uh, regions that uh, the yellow or the red arrows pointing at. Let's look at the red one. So the single frame, well, single frame has a false merge in the, in the area that actually doesn't exist in HR, right? And if you look at the LR version, it's kind of there. So bilinear is not smart enough to, to clear it up, but the multi-frame version, because it takes this additional information from its neighboring frames, it's able to actually clean this frame up for us. And there we get a nice break. So that's something that's pretty encouraging for us. And the same thing happens in when we take the real world low res and high res version. Um, also from the quantification, the PSNR, the SM and the resolution. So we can see that um, multi-frame performs better than single frame in this uh, live cell time lapses data. And here, I'm, again, I'm showing a lot of videos. This is, you're still looking at a mitochondria network. Um, now, left, low res, right, high res. This is a pretty, pretty amazing video, um, personally. Like the left version is very noisy and you really cannot tell what's the detail. But the, the right one, which is the PSSR restored version, it gives you much more detail. And you don't see that cell stressing, cell bleaching problem anymore. And I wanna highlight here, because of the increasement, uh, increase of the spatial and temporal resolution, we are actually able to capture a fission event. So mitochondria constantly go through fission and fusion events. Uh, in this case, to the right, again, the, the PSSR version, so right here, let me play it again if I can. Can you hear me? I think I'm frozen. Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. What is it? <clears throat> But Do you see my slide moving? I, I think it's frozen. I, I don't have control of my computer. I think your video has might have stopped. 
right? This is this is a video, but it's not moving, right? No, no, no. Mm. no. Okay, so I think I lost my. I think my computer is freezing. What should I do? What should, what would you suggest me to do now? Um, if you can, and you maybe move to another slide. I cannot move with my ah. laptop. I'm sorry for that. Maybe you can turn off and turn it on and log back in while Alex, me, and Alexandro will entertain the audience. <laughs> Are you going to tell a joke? Or, we can do the your, quiz if you like. Or read right. your poetry. Oh, no. That's, that's <laughs> Hopefully, she'll just take a second to restart <laughs> or reconnect. Who can so juggle? I really like the crappification name. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Curti, as you are already in the tube, can you can you sing and play music or <laughs> you pay me well? I will I will <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to say this actually in my group because we had um well often when you work in a facility you get people asking the impossible and they want to um, have the impossible like now immediately and there was someone who came and asked about lots of things and it became bigger and bigger ask and then my colleague looked at me and said can we do this and I just looked at them and I said well we can't do this but I can sing and dance for you <laughs> so then ever whenever someone asks some really difficult thing my group usually says hey let's sing and dance instead <laughs> We don't have to use it too often, but it's terrifying enough. Just, just people disappear and they don't ask again. <laughs> Maybe, Alexandro, you can ask the questions you were planning to ask the audience. You know, what, what kind of uh, talks, things, and if, if audience have anything to say, mm -hmm. like what kind of speakers and topics, so I... yeah, things like those, if you're looking for, you can tell us now. Actually, can I, can I, I mean, I have um, a topic of debate that uh, maybe can take some time. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been traditionally quite skeptical about uh, uh, the applications of deep learning um, to super resolution. But a few years ago, uh, during a focus on microscopy, I actually kind of got, let's say, converted. Um, the, 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 the idea for me, the important thing is to try to understand what actually uh, the, um, the network is actually doing. And uh, I wonder if uh, there is literature or people that have explained if, for example, the network is just uh, is, uh, is actually guessing the priors, let's say, because if you have a good prior, you have, uh, you know, infinite resolution in principle. Uh, uh, so does it guess the priors? Can you extract the priors of a network? I don't know if any of you have a, a thought about this or... I, I think like there are now papers where, where they are uh, starting to look like more like uh, computer science people who are... Oh, so Lynn is here now. <laughs> Back again, so... I'll ask this later to Julie. The poor woman, <laughs> I'm so sorry, but um, I'm so sorry. I hope it's okay. We had actually a very interesting start <laughs> of a discussion, just to kind of keep That's everybody good. entertained. Um, I was like, oh no. It's okay. Don't worry, but um, okay. Let me. Are you restart. If it's back, then that uh, will be great. It's funny that I, I was enjoying it, and then suddenly it everything. was very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Streaming sometimes is um, and probably because it's me. Oh, that's me. lovely. It's now now it's back to, it's fine. Yes, it's is it stuck again, Lynn? I think I'm froze again. Maybe it's this one slide. So maybe um, I mean it is. We did see it once. It actually went through once. Right. Yeah. So, well, how about this? Um, let me re-enter again, but then I'm going to start from the next slide. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that would be good. That. Yeah, don't worry, yeah, that would be best. So I think, Alessandro, you can continue no. your provocative question. Curti, Curti had an answer. 
I didn't have an answer, but I I know like people are looking at uh, each layer now. So what kind of output we are getting from from the initial input and just because with every layer the complexity increases, right? So it's it's very difficult. But but I think like uh, isn't in microscopy field we are used to living with black boxes now. Uh, black never. Black boxes. <laughs> I mean, how many people are using? I'm interested. The Airy scan. Can people maybe raise their hand if they are using it? I don't know if it works, but um. We have some some hands up. Oh yeah. And Stephanie, and then you have your hand. Yeah, a few. Yeah, maybe you can tell about your experience with Airy scan. I mean, now it's almost like um, you press the button and you get results type of implementation. But um, the first versions weren't quite this easy. Which as a scientist is reassuring, but actually as a core facility manager, I would much prefer the option where I can just press a button and the images look better. Um, but that's, I guess, the part of the discussion. Are we kind of, <laughs> this is a bit, um, <laughs> I feel like the kind of news reader who suddenly kind of like has to <laughs> be providing the kind of stand up comedy or something. <laughs> the teleprompter <laughs> stopped. <laughs> yeah. So let's make up some news. <laughs> what do we do? I mean, does the audience do, has anybody have any questions? I mean, would anyone, I mean, for the people who have an airy scan, or I mean, is it useful to kind of ask? Just put some questions in if you like to have, um, I mean, people like Alessandro or Kirti can also help with, um, you know, if you have specific questions for your work. Maybe everybody is just having their lunch while they're watching us struggle with technology <laughs> today. <laughs> so we have microscopes now you can click a button and do everything but not zoom <laughs> oh there oh, you go yeah <laughs> i'm back here's lynn, here's lynn. Let's see. <laughs> we were just running out of bad jokes so <laughs> <laughs> so i'm going to start with the next slide so you can see it right it's, it's yeah not... that's fine okay. yep, yep. now we can yeah. see so, um, so basically, the previous video was showing we do we we were able to use PSFSR restore version to capture capture a fission event of the mitochondria, and so in this case, again, we're looking at the mitochondria trafficking along this axon, and then left is the input low res, and right uh, right is the high res, and you see this low res version if we if we draw a line across. Um, Oh, actually, there's a previous slide, but it's okay. Yeah, you see this. You see this low res version that when two mitochondria passing over each other, you're not able. Uh, supposedly, I have previous slide. I have a line plot of this line, the the yellow line that I draw here. But for a technical reason, I'm not gonna go back. Um, basically, you you will not be able to resolve this two mitochondria that passes along each other but you are able to nicely see two bumps in this high, a high re, a PSSR restored version. And again, this is also can be captured by the chymograph that I'm showing here, that you can see these two structures are nicely split by um, with the gap in the PSSR version, but they are merged together in the low res version. And also, uh, from the chymograph or even from the video itself, you can also see that the PSSR restore version, you don't see that hopping pattern anymore. This mitochondria, they move nicely, and, which means we have a higher improved temporal resolution. Okay, so very end, to summarize that PSSR really served as a practical and effective method um, for people to to be able to restore and increase the resolution um, to denoising at the same time, at, um, 
from, from the low res version to high res for images of coin scanning systems. For this to work, we don't need to painfully sitting under the microscope taking the real world training hairs. Instead, the semi-synthetically created hairs just do fine. And for live cell imaging, we developed this multi-frame approach, training approach that can alleviate this flickering and noisy artifact that we see in the um, PSSR vanilla version, the single frame version, and that enables us to do live cell time-lapse imaging. So finally, thank you, Paige. So our AI is 100% dependent on natural intelligence and AI. So <laughs> uh, who was my supervisor, who's my, my supervisor and he's super supportive of everything. And he's like this Jewish mom of, in my life that always tells you to always take care of you in life and in science. And then we have Kristen Harris and Lindsay Kirk from uh, University of Texas, Austin, that helps with the imaging of the EM data and the analysis of the segmentation of the vesicles. And Sammy Wise and Novak, as I mentioned before, who did the reconstruction of these um, different structures using the EM stack. And he's also involved in the vesicle segmentation analysis. And Goshen Blenda from UCSD and Kara from Salk um, were helped with the neuron imaging and the fission quantification analysis. And then Tong and Kara, they did the mitochondrial imaging. And I also want to highlight Jeremy Howard from Fast AI. He really gave us some um, critical high level ideas when we face some challenges. And Fred Monroe, who is the one that I closely work with day and night developing this piece of software. So thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, here's another picture of the sunset of the same day from a different angle. And at the very end, I just want to say that please stay tuned for our paper, which will be hopefully will be very soon go live in Nature Methods. If it's not the next one, probably it's the next next one. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for um, taking the time listening to my talk and then I'm happy to take questions and ideas. Thanks. Thanks Lynn for, for the great talk. I think we already have a few questions and uh, and I will ask uh, the first one. Um, so, so you mentioned, I think this SSIM structure similarity index that uh, you mentioned to quantify the images. So how do you calculate that between a high res and a low res image like so? How does how, it work? How do I what? How, how do you calculate the structural similarity index between a high res and a low res image like? Oh, you compare this, you compare this image with um, the HR version. So for example, the low res version, um, you you calculate the structural similarity between the well between the low res and ground truth. Because there's hardly any structure in the low like in the low signal image. Yes, that's why it gives you a much worse performance. That's my understanding. Um, did, did I answer your question correctly? It's always like referring to the high res, referring to your ground truth and see how good or how good you mimic the, the high res. Can, can you repeat how it works? Structural similarity index, how the algorithm works itself? Um, structural similarity is, so well, the PSNR, PSNR, which is the peaks signal to noise ratio is pretty obvious. It's basically a measurement of the signal to noise ratio, which is pixel wise. But when that just came up, it's not enough because the pixel correspondence or pixel level of fidelity was not enough to reflect the actual image quality. Even just with PSNR and SSIM, it's also not enough. That's why we introduced some other metrics like FRC to measure the resolution or even some other quantification. Basically the structural similarity is um, to, to measure how similar it is. It's, it's a better metric to reflect um, the f fidelity that's similar to human perception. Does that make sense? Alexander, you had your classic uh, question. <laughs> Sorry, uh, while, while um, we had to entertain the public, I was uh, proposing one of the questions that I 
always would like to ask in these situations with these uh, applications within this way. Um, so it's a, first of all, it was a very nice um, uh, talk. And I just, my question comes from uh, a level of skepticism that I had actually in the past. Uh, and I think he's, uh, I hope you will understand is actually kind of a healthy skepticism, uh, not just a prejudice against um, new things. Um, and uh, so when I was seeing these impressive results, and then I was constantly saying, well, you know, you have uh, machine learning that is actually guessing uh, what an image could be, but uh, why do I need to trust a software? And I wouldn't trust a colleague that say to me, you know, this image should be that, yes? Um, but then I realized I was wrong, at least in part, um, because uh, of course, uh, the um, deep learning may learn which are the priors. Let's say if you think in a, in an old-fashioned image restoration point of view, and if he's learning the the right priors, in principle has but can have a, an infinite resolution um, because you know if you give the right priors, like we, what we do in uh, localization microscopy, you know you know that is. Uh, let's say an ellipsoid is your PSF and therefore you are only photon limited. So I wanted to ask you, is there any, any way uh, or it, did anyone uh, study this to try to understand if what actually the, the network is doing, is it learning the prior and what this prior would look like or is it just a ridiculous question? <laughs> well, yeah, that's always like the the hardest question to answer. And I constantly get get these questions, even from the multiple rounds of the reviewing process oh. from the reviewers, yes. So um, I would say the central idea is using deep learning with caution and always validate using your realistic data before, before actually being able to trust it on your, on your research. So, um, I would like to give you an example of, of the EM one. Let's use the standard, let's use the classic, oops. Okay, so, so let's look at the real world, this example, this is a testing result. Okay, this is my favorite um, panel. Um, you can, you, as you can see that the PSSR version, these vesicles, um, they are so nicely restored. In this case, this is not, I would say this is not um, practical in the, you know, physical principle base that, the, the, you know, with the, using the prior and then we do compressed sensing and get a higher resolution version of using the PSF, PSF basically physics and school based um, both methods. It's, it's not possible to, I would say it's not possible to get um, this selective restoration of structures. Yes, yes. I, 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 but uh, sorry if I interrupt. It's just, um, I guess that uh, if you, and I'm, a, I'm not a super resolution person and um, uh, um, we just do a little bit of, in machine learning. So my, my question comes from ignorance. Uh, if, if I you know, remember the, the work that uh, Google has done driving machine, their deep learning in reverse, where they see you know, what, uh, what the algorithms can, can think. You know? uh, uh, so I wonder if uh, we know, is, the mach is uh, deep learning learning you know, the shape of uh, a, a typical vesicles, for example, or typical membranes. And uh, are they stored in some of the layers and we can see them as a prototypes or, or is really a ridiculous question? I'm, I'm fine with it if it is. Well, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think I have an explicit okay. answer to that. Yeah, but again, I also want to highlight, I also want to emphasize in this case again, for example, in this case, if your downstream study is to study the, the tiny structures in, these, in, the, in, the side of, in the vesicles, instead of these vesicles itself, then this model is not a good model for you. Because it, as you can see that probably some of you are a wonder, this image looks a little bit over smooth. 
than is supposed to be. You might have this doubt. Okay. And this, yeah, this is a common thing for, so we use uh, MSE, which is the mean square error as our loss function. And this is a common issue with the, uh, with the vanilla mean square error because the loss function is really simple. But it, because of that simplicity, we also get this good um, gener generalizable ability across multiple samples. But then in this case, you really need to see that if you're someone who studied the vesicle, then this is an amazing thing that you can, you can uh, incorporate into your pipeline. But let's say if you're studying, say, the, the, the chromosome or like the, you know, the structure that's floating around in the, in, in the cell membrane or the nucleus, then you might need to validate further. And, okay. and there's also like an open area. We also, we're also continuing doing the research. If you change another loss function, actually we have some really nice data beyond this paper, like using feature loss um, to learn the patterns of the image. And mm -hmm. that gives you much more realistic, um, less over smooth result. But hopefully I kind of partially answered your question. But yeah, that's- Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, since Lynn, you have to go around too, we will take the questions first and then we will do the, the quiz afterwards. So, um, uh, Nicholas has a very nice question and he, he asks like, uh, how do you decide on the extent of crapification, you know, because it seems right. to make sense. Yes, yes. That's a very good point. And I was worried that I might run out of time, so I didn't highlight it because if I started, I need to take another. Uh, <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes. But basically, before we decide to use which noise, what noise pattern, we did like an ablation study in both the EM data. So I, I do have an additional slide here that I didn't show. Um, we did an ablation study of different uh, noise injection, but the same downsampling, simple, um, I think, simple downsampling in four, uh, four times in X and Y, but with different noise. So for example, in this case, we have the low res acquired. Uh, we have the no noise, which is simple, just synthetically downsampled version without any noise injection. We have the inju injection of the saw noise. We have the Gaussian noise. We have the additive Gaussian noise and we have the ground truth. So basically these are, I'm not showing the results. I'm showing you the training image, how the, how the training image data pairs look like. And then again, we quantify on, the, on all of them. And then we figured out that the additive Gaussian st stood out. Um, so if you look at the, the red box circled models, these are the ones that's um, crapified with noise injection. And if you look at the quantification or the image, then you can see that the add additive Gaussian one is is, um, is the winner. And another interesting thing we did was we also try to compare, what if we compare this to actually real world take um, acquired training data pairs. So we also have this model compared here, which is circled in this um, uh, blue box. And as you can see that the, the real world pairs is actually a little bit worse than, than our crap five version. And another interesting that we did was we used the same level, same fashion of crapification of the winner among all the crap five version, which is the additive Gaussian. And we use, everything's the same, except the amount of the data. We used 80 more, 80 times more data, which is in this green box. As you can see that the PSNRS and SSIM, they are not really incre increased that much. But the resolution is uh, is increased, and that you can that that's also reflected in the visualized image. So this is also like this is the way how we test which one is better, and um, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think we move on to uh, next question, which is from James Walsh, and I think it's it's, it's a very important question. So he asked like. Doesn't the resolution metric reflect uh, that AI or your algorithm is adding high resolution information into the image, regardless whether it's real or rubbish? So basically, regardless what? Whether it's real or rubbish, like because so you 
So yeah, because this ah. high, yeah. go ahead. Right. So that that on that to that question, we need to come back to the, this additive Gaussian thing. So the the difference between the additive Gaussian and the Gaussian is that we apply evenly distributed independent Gaussian noise in the Gaussian version. For the additive Gaussian, we apply more noise on the pixels or regions with structures. And we apply less noise in the background places. So I'm not sure if that's, that's a way to highlight where to focus on these images during the training process. But because of this slight change, it gives us much better results. I think like, uh, uh, I haven't thought uh, this question through, but like from where is this high frequency information coming in? Like, how does the algorithm generate this? Like, because- yeah, you, you always have these training pairs. Like, like what I said, your resolution always has the limit of your high res ground truth target. That's that's it's, that's the, the target, the holy grail of the during the training process, and you're just trying your best to optimize this giant, um, hyper-dimensional network. Try to, you know, reach to its prime performance to mimic the high res, and it's not well, it's not possible to re to go beyond the resolution of your target. And I guess that's where you you see the that's where you see the high resolution information coming from. I mean, yeah, uh, in, in the end, I think uh, if, if maybe James will ask himself, but I think like, let's say like if something is missing, right, uh, which was in your high resolution and maybe that's some real biology and uh, despite that fact, the algorithm will always add it, right? So let's say you have a chromosome and there's a break in the chromosome for whatever reason and because in the high res, you traditionally have a very smooth or whatever chromosome, it will always map back to that, right? So, so, so the actual biology, if there are any, let's say, heterogeneity to the samples, uh, it, it might go missing. Um, right. I think there are several angles to this question. Also, like uh, classically, the band with that uh, microscopists talk about. I will quickly move on to uh, Valeria's, Valeria's question, which is also very nice. Uh, in, uh, so she says, in, in, in the point scanning confocal, do you need to close as much as you can the pinhole in order to have the best Z resolution to be able to construct high resolution image in X and Y with PSSR? I think this is a quite a good question. How critical is the Z resolution? How good the resolution of the Z is. We actually, when we were trying to um, take these low res and the high res pairs of the training data, yeah, for example, like in, 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 in this case, we actually try to, for the low res version, we actually try to slightly open the pinhole that, that a little bit, not to reach, not to reach its prime performance um, to, to create a, like a degraded version, a more noisy version of the low res. And for the high res, um, we actually use AirScan, a microscope called AirScan, which is um, like a higher, a higher version of confocal. It also uses scanning laser beam, but it has 32 detectors. And then afterwards, you use, you use pixel reassignment technique to reconstruct this this final image and um, so basically we do not use a standard confocal detector for low res and high res instead we use the air scan and the low res confocal piece as our pairs and in terms of the temporal resolution we do not explore that we went with the same um, sampling in, in, in time yeah, so Stephanie tells me to let you go because I guess you have another appointment, but we will do the uh, quiz now. So people, if you want uh, a full scope, please stay back and participate in the quiz. I think the link is somewhere here, right, Stephanie? Uh, the Mentimeter link. Okay, it's it's right here. I have just posted it in the chat window. And mm -hmm. you lock. Some people have already signed in, but I can um, I can share it again. Yeah. And here it is. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, you have done that as well. So, um, 
going to share my screen. Yeah. Don't worry, Stephanie. We never have expectation of you getting it right. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, no. I was giving me a hard time. So, share screen. I think. Is that it? That's it. Okay. So I wanted to start with, we were talking about poetry. I liked um, very much, we kind of all, I think, looked at the inauguration with most of us, I'm sure, with great pleasure. And I really loved the poetry, especially the line, for there's always the light if only we are bra brave enough to see it, and if only we are brave enough to be it. So I thought I'd ask you all how you feel today. And because we're talking about light microscopy most of the time, I really liked um, this. So. <laughs> okay, we come now. If everybody has signed in, we come to the yeah. Take your time, but <laughs> I like the someone. A lot of people feel good looking. I'm glad it's going to be replaced now by full of light, which is better, I think. <laughs> but why not good looking? It's good. <laughs> okay, so. So I'm going to the, um, so the Mentimeter, so just for, for Lynn. So these are the people who've signed up. I think we probably don't have that many today, but um, it's actually, um, you can then, when you answer these as quickly as possible and as well as possible, you can win a full scope. So these are Glenn's question. What is the eternal triangle comp, uh, oops, sorry, yep. I did it again. What is the eternal triangle compromise for microscopic imaging? And rightly so, most people knew that it's sensitivity, resolution, and speed. Only five people, Stephanie, so. I know, but that's an easy way then to win a full scoop. So um, question two. Yeah, no, people have kind of, I think we're a bit over time. And then what does cropification approach stand for? And there, it was a bit tricky because I needed to kind of shorten the answers so that they would fit in. And I hope you see that but there's a bit of an intricacy in the testing and training answers. So I think maybe that was really tricky, but um, so basically it's down sample high resolution images with noise injected images for training, I think was the right answer. That was very difficult, sorry, because I had to really make the answer quite short to fit it into the Mentimeter restrictions. And question number three, what are the benefits of the multi-frame design for live cell time-lapse imaging? And I think there were good examples that should be um, in a few seconds. So is it increased both temporal and spatial? increase temporal, increase spatial, reduce flickering artifacts, and you got some A and D. And again, I think that was quite tricky, I'm sorry, but um, it's not so easy sometimes to provide actually the question and answers for this Mentimeter thing really well. But um, if I go now to the final slide, then we had um, those people were participating and um, the person who's thinky behind this, you actually won a fold scope. So if you're still in lockdown for a few more weeks, months to come, then you can at least do a bit of fold scope microscopy. I guess that's the point. I think Lin Jing, we would actually have to work really hard to kind of get a fold scope image into a proper kind of image, but that was um, that's our tradition. So thanks everybody. So if, thank you. If you want to email me who you are, then I will put this into the post for you. And then I'll stop sharing my screen. Let's thank again. I mean, this was amazing then actually. I'm really, really grateful. And it was a really good talk. I think it really showed a lot of applications and your developments and how amazing we are now in terms of providing fast and really biological imaging, because I guess that's often, I mean, you showed in M imaging, but I guess also the biological imaging in particular will greatly benefit from being able to use noisy images for 
high resolution, high, high quality imaging by working with people like you and what you're providing. So um, yeah, if everybody could thank um, Lynn, I mean, if you want to kind of clap or this is always the awkward thing, we can never end these meetings digni dignified. <laughs> Well, thank you very much and I hope you thank have a good day and you can have breakfast now and yeah I'm gonna get a lot of coffee now very grateful that you could um, join us thank you very much thank you <laughs> thank you everybody thank you. else also for asking questions and joining us and thank you